Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, second day of our uh, Billy Graham uh, symposium. Uh, and uh, today, indeed, is uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Mr. Graham's actual birthday, uh, the centennial. And uh, if, if you think about it, born in uh, 1918 compared to 2018, what are the differences in the, the Christian world? And the, dis uh, the, the differences really are uh, enormous in so many ways, but so many of them uh, are, uh, concern the, uh, the global nature of faith. In 1918, uh, Christianity was very much a Euro-American religion. It was uh, Europe and North America. Europe and North America between them constituted over 80% of the world's Christians, possibly significantly uh, more than that. And uh, by the time you get to today, what is the figure? I believe it's gone from 82 to maybe 30, 37 or 38 and that proportion is falling um, steadily. So if you had to pick the most important change in the last 100 years, well, we could get many arguments about that, but I would certainly make an argument for the growth of world Christianity, global Christianity. I should explain, um, I don't actually like those terms because when you talk about world Christianity, it suggests there's another kind. And if Christianity is not aiming at a world scale and a world level, what is it? Is it just for one country? Is it just for one city? Who, who would want to be a member of a faith that is like that? Christianity is a world religion or it is nothing. And so it was so important for us when we planned this conference to have something about the Billy Graham in global uh, perspective and I'm delighted to say we managed to uh, find three um, extremely talented, extremely qualified scholars to, uh, uh, to discuss this. And let me say a little bit about the format. Uh, each of them will be speaking for a relatively uh, short period. Um, then we'll take that into a larger conversation between uh, the members among the members of the group, between and among, always through me. I, I could never get that right. And then throw it open for general uh, questions and, uh, uh, and discussions. And our first uh, presenter is um, Alistair uh, Chapman, who was uh, born and raised in uh, England, did his undergraduate and uh, doctoral work at the University of uh, Cambridge. Um, I can say many things about him, but can I just underline, he wrote a book about John Stott called Godly um, Ambition, John Stott and the Evangelical Movement, which is such a good exemplary book. And as I was saying to him earlier, anyone can write books which are very, very long and seemingly endless, but if you can take what you have to say and put it in 150 pages and 200 pages, and those pages are pure gold, then that is a serious achievement. And so I really recommend the Godly Ambition book uh, 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 to you. He's a professor of history at Westmont College. He lives in uh, Santa Barbara, uh, California. And uh, his talk uh, is titled, The One That Got Away, Query, Billy Graham and the Lausanne Movement. Alistair uh, Chapman, thank you. Thank you, Philip, for that generous introduction, and uh, thank you to uh, all of the good folk at Baylor for inviting me here, Tommy and Alicia. Thank you, Leon, for all of your great work behind the scenes. I'm honored to be uh, on a panel with uh, Helen and Uta, and very much look forward to our discussion. So the one that got away, question mark, Billy Graham and the Lausanne movement. I was learning yesterday of a survey that uh, somebody had done of American Christians asking uh, who was the most influential person in the history of American religion, and Billy Graham came in second. Uh, apparently, number one was God, um, and uh, that's fairly high praise to come second only to God, and as uh, Grant Wacker was sharing with us last night, Graham was certainly a very successful person. 
and the sort of person who typically accomplished the goals that he set for himself. And so it's instructive to look at any moments in Graham's life when things did not go his way. And one of the clear examples of that is with the Lausanne movement. Maybe. Um, when one gives in, uh, when one is asked for the title of, of, of an address one is going to give many months in the future, one will write something down uh, and then you'll come back to it when it's actually time to prepare and wonder what exactly it was that you've been thinking about six months before. I'm very glad in retrospect that I put a question mark after the one that got away rather than a full stop. Um, because I'm not entirely sure about what the answer is to this question, whether the Lausanne movement was something that got away from Graham uh, or whether it was something that he deliberately let go. And so I'm glad to see so many informed uh, colleagues uh, in the audience and on the panel today, and hopefully you can help me figure out the answer to this question. Let me start by giving a brief introduction to the Lausanne movement to any who may be unfamiliar with it. Uh, Lausanne started as the International Congress on World Evangelization in July 1974. That date is significant as we may think about later. Um, it took place in Lausanne, Switzerland, hence the name, and 2,500 evangelicals from all over the world gathered to discuss world evangelization. Uh, there was a clock in the uh, foyer of the conference which showed the rising world population as the conference took place. Uh, world evangelization was one half of the aim of Lausanne. The other was to provide something of an evangelical alternative to the ecumenical World Council of Churches, which uh, although now is not such a prominent organization, was very, very uh, significant in church circles in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. The Congress itself was a success. It garnered attention in Time magazine and many other places. And it showed that Billy Graham was not just a great preacher. He was not just somebody who could build great institutions uh, in North America, but was truly a leader for evangelicals worldwide. Nevertheless, the Congress was bumpy. And in particular, there was a tension at Lausanne between evangelicals from the United States and evangelicals from the developing world, especially from Latin America. In an era of independence movements in the developing world, uh, the era of Vietnam, the era of Watergate, there was a significant degree of criticism of American missionaries and American evangelicals more broadly, and a desire that evangelicals would pay more attention to social and economic justice. And there are many people who've now written wonderfully and widely on this topic. If you need further resources, I'm happy to point you in that direction. Those cracks were papered over uh, at Lausanne in a marvelously diplomatic conference statement that was largely drafted by John Stott, but the cracks were still there. Um, it came to a head six months later in Mexico City in one of the famous set-piece moments uh, of evangelical history in the second half of the 20th century, which somebody referred to last night when Stott and Graham had a disagreement over the future of the Lausanne movement. And in brief, what happened was that Graham stood up on the first night and said, this organization move, moving forward is going to have a strong and sole emphasis on evangelism. Stott stood up the following morning, said that he disagreed with Graham, said that the organization needed to reflect the Lausanne Covenant and therefore it had to include social justice and Graham backed down. Now, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association continued to fund Lausanne, but it was clear that Graham was not particularly committed to Lausanne in the years that followed. Uh, when it came to Lausanne II at Manila in 1989, Graham was only the honorary chairman of the event, and he actually threatened to resign from that position shortly before the Congress because he was so annoyed with the rising costs of the event. 
So what happened uh, in this moment? I am not entirely sure, as I said at the outset. I think there are three main options. Um, the first option is that Graham lost control. He tried to land the fish. He wrestled with it, but the fish got away from him at Mexico City. At the other end of the spectrum, Graham actually caught the fish, and he held it, and he pondered it, but he didn't really like what he saw, and so he returned it to the water. In the middle of those two options, Graham tried to land the fish, but it wriggled like mad, and eventually he decided it was just going to be better to give up the fight and let this feisty fish return to the waters. Now, I'm open to any three of those explanations. I think the third is the most likely, but if, if that is the case, if there was a struggle that Graham eventually decided that he was going to back down from, why? Um, what was he thinking in those weeks and months? I came up with at least seven explanations. I'm gonna give you just four, which I think are the most likely. Um, number one, he looked at the other possible leaders for Lausanne, in particular John Stott and Leighton Ford, and thought, I'm not really needed here. Uh, this organization can go on quite well, thank you very much, even if I'm not the prime steerer. Number two, Graham may just not have wanted to argue over this issue. Uh, I think when maybe especially in Christian circles, when people get to an elevated level where people don't criticize them very often, when they do get criticized, that can become very uncomfortable very quickly. And I'm not sure that Graham wanted that stress, and I'm not sure he wanted to dirty himself by getting down in the trenches and really arguing through with these people to press his point. Thirdly, Graham may have thought, well, this Lausanne idea is nice, but actually we don't really need it. Uh, world evangelization has been getting along quite well without Lausanne, and it will get on quite well without it in the future anyway. So that may have been another reason he was willing to let it go. And then fourthly, and I'm sure this is true, I'm not sure whether this is the primary explanation, uh, at the end of the day, Graham was, as Grant Wacker pointed out last night, he was an evangelist. He wanted to give his life and ministry to crusades and not to evangelical diplomacy. And in the years after Lausanne, he's much more excited to give his time and attention to a series of conferences that he puts on in Amsterdam for itinerant evangelists. And there's a great article that he writes, which I can share later if, if you're interested, where he essentially disses Lausanne and says, it's the Amsterdam people who are doing the real work of evangelism. It's an intriguing moment. And I've written elsewhere about what I think this tells us about the nature of the evangelical movement. But what does this confrontation tell us about Billy Graham? That I'm less sure about. I look forward to our conversation later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our, uh, our second uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Helen uh, Kim, who is uh, Assistant Professor of American uh, Religious History at uh, Emory in the Canada School of Theology. Uh, her MDiv and PhD are from uh, uh, Harvard. Uh, she is uh, working on a couple of uh, projects of, uh, uh, of great interest. Uh, one is a book called uh, Trans-Pacific Piety and Politics, Cold War South Korea and the uh, rise of modern American evangelicalism. And she's also a co-author of uh, a forthcoming book on contemporary American religious nuns. And as I always have to say here, N-O-N-E, that kind of nuns. Um, but uh, a, a scholar working on uh, very important uh, topics. And uh, Dr. Kim's uh, title today will be a very good question. Why was Graham's largest crusade in South Korea, of all places? A very good question. Good morning, everyone. 
morning. Thanks so much, Philip, for the introduction. And it's great to be on this panel with you, Uta and Alistair. And uh, thanks so much, Alicia Kaufman, Tommy Kidd, and Liam Moore for inviting me here. And um, Jerry Park for your warm welcome to Baylor. It's great to be with you all this morning. And indeed, this morning, I would like to talk to you all about the question, why was Billy Graham's largest crusade in South Korea of all places? Here we have a, a photo featured at his largest crusade, in fact. This is Ju June 3rd, 1973, and it is a scorching hot summer Sunday. Billy Graham preached his largest crusade this day, not in his southern hometown or in the Sun Belt, but across the Pacific Ocean in South Korea. Indeed, with the help of Billy jong Hwan Kim, his Korean translator, Graham preached at the Yoido Plaza in Seoul, Korea to a staggering 1.1 million people. And you can see here on the left at the podium, there's Graham in the gray suit. And then you can see Billy jong Hwan Kim right next to him to the right, and he's uh, standing where there's a customized larger podium made for two people. And, uh, you know, Graham starts, it stands over six feet, and Billy jong Hwan Kim is just a little over five feet, so he has an extra uh, podium there, just a booster to get him up higher <laughs> over the podium. And they're speaking to 1.1 million people. Over the course of five days of revival, 73,000 people made decisions for Christ. This was also the most of any Graham crusade. So why was Graham's largest crusade hosted in South Korea of all places? Now to address this central question, I'd like to first give a bit of background. The first American Protestant missionaries arrived in Korea in the late 19th century to not only convert Korean souls to Christianity, but also the nation to an American style of democracy. And you could think of the first missionaries such as Henry Appenzeller, um, a Methodist. Um, you know, he was at Drew Seminary and he went over with um, other Presbyterians at that time. And of course, Presbyterianism really took off in um, the Korean context, but Methodism was also so um, gained good ground at that time. But at this time, the US state had little political interest in the Korean Peninsula. In fact, under the Taft-Kotsua Agreement in 1905, the US brokered a deal to permit Japan's annexation of Korea in exchange for colonial rule over the Philippines. With Korea's liberation from Japanese imperialism in 1945 and then the U.S. military presence in Korea since then, U.S. interests in the peninsula did shift. So unlike the first wave of Protestant missionaries, Graham first visited Korea following trans-Pacific routes paved by the U.S. military during the Korean War, the first hot war of the Cold War. And after he went to Korea in 1952, he published a circular titled, I Saw Your Sons at War, Billy Graham's Korean War Diary, which can be viewed at Wheaton College. Um, the expansion of American political and military interests in Korea in the late 20th century necessitates the contextualization of Graham's largest crusade in the context of the global Cold War. So with that background, I'll jump into the question, why South Korea, 1973? I want to suggest four categories to think about this question. First, religious experience. Second, the Cold War politics of detente. Third, the enduring legacies of the Korean War, a war that continues today with the division of North and South Korea. And four, South Korean leadership. I argue that Graham's largest crusade was possible in South Korea, 1973, not only because of the common theological vision between South Korean Protestants and American evangelicals for the total evangelization of the world, but also because the crusade advanced diplomatic relations between the US and South Korea, two nations inseparable to the crucible of war. This is an argument I explore further in a book I'm writing with Oxford Press titled Trans-Pacific Piety and Politics, Cold War South Korea and the Rise of Modern American Evangelicalism. So let's first turn to religious experiences at Graham's largest crusade. 
For Jiang Oh, a Korean war orphan and member of the World Vision Korean Orphan Choir, 1973 was a year of spiritual awakening. That year, she faced uncertainties about her future. She had lived in the World Vision dormitories nearly her whole life, but once she graduated high school, she would have nowhere to go. It was at this time that she attended the 1973 Graham Crusades Youth Night, where she had the pivotal realization that she was, quote, spiritually blind. She recalled, quote, it just suddenly came to me. I realized I had been a Pharisee up until then. And the crusade was a stepping stone for her later conversion experience, what she called her born again experience. And she recounted this experience to me um, during an oral history I conducted with her in Korean um, about three summers ago. When I asked her what it meant to be born again, she recalled, quote, before I believed with my head, but now I believed with my heart. At the same time, these powerful individual religious experiences alone do not provide historical explanation as to why South Korea, 1973. 1973 was not necessarily an auspicious year for revival theologically or politically. The idealized notion of spreading the good news held at this time, according to Dana Robert, a quote, connotation of Christian superiority and a history of Western coercion. Moreover, the Yushin Constitution, instituted in Korea in 1972 by President Park Chung-hee, instantiated an unprecedented authoritarian political structure, what some call the, quote, dark age of democracy in South Korea. Under Yushin, freedom of speech was strictly curtailed, including religious expression. So how did Graham preach his largest crusade during the nadir of South Korean democracy? Let's consider the historical context of the Cold War, including detente, which is my second point. Under the Cold War geopolitical conditions of detente, Nixon unilaterally decided to reduce US troops in Korea, and his visit to China in 1972 created an unstable geopolitical environment in which Park justified the declaration of the Yushin Constitution to protect national security and economic progress. In this tense period of U.S.-South Korean relations, Park believed that the Graham Crusade could facilitate people-to-people -people diplomacy, to foster closer relations between the two nations, especially to discourage the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Korea. Moreover, it would not have been lost on Park that Graham was close friends with Nixon. According to Billy Kim, and this was from an oral history that I also conducted with him in Korea, quote, Park said, if we invite Billy Graham, it's better than one division of US military stationed here in Korea for national security. Because Billy Graham is so well known, he will televise his crusade back to the United States. They will know we need to save South Korea from North Korean attack. Placing the crusade in the historical context of the global Cold War suggests the diplomatic incentives that the Park regime had in supporting non-state actors such as Billy and Billy to host a Christian crusade. To be sure, <clears throat> when Graham arrived in South Korea, his stated purpose was not politics, but souls. Graham declared upon his arrival, quote, I'm not here as an American. I represent a higher court in the White House. I'm an ambassador of the King of Kings. At the same time, the moment he stepped off the plane and the band played America the Beautiful to greet him, South Koreans also understood that Graham represented America, the country's most important political ally, the more powerful big brother in US-Korean relations, and the ascendant superpower in the global Cold War order. In 1973, on South Korean soil, Graham indeed represented both God and America, and he went on to meet with Philip Habib, the ambassador to South Korea, as well as um, have meetings with Park jung hee at the Blue House, um, which, is not, which is the parallel to the White House in America. He could do so because of the enduring theological and political legacies of the Korean War, which is my third point. When Billy and Billy mounted the podium to preach the love of God, 
Memories of the Korean War took center stage at Graham's largest crusade. Graham began. This is at the top of the sermon, the first anecdote that he begins with. Quote, 22 years ago, I was in Korea. It was during Christmas time, and it was very cold. I've never been so cold in all my life, and I toured along what is now the DMZ. He then went on to paint a military image that underscored Christian martyrdom as he suggested parallels between the self-sacrifice of the U.S. soldier in Korea and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. He remembered 12 U.S. soldiers in his anecdote, not unlike the 12 disciples of Christ. Graham then used this image of U.S. soldiers during the Korean War to illustrate the central passage from the Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. At this revivalistic pinnacle, the U.S. military could not be forgotten in Korea, and Graham suggested a close relationship between Americans and South Koreans revealing the Crusades' theological as well as important diplomatic significance. Even for Graham, Billy Kim, Graham's translator, memories of the Korean War resurfaced as he noted his evolution from rags to riches. Once a, quote, shabby U.S. military houseboy during the war, Billy Kim now stated that he looked, quote, stately on the right side of Billy Graham. Billy and Billy relied upon the legacies of the Korean War to draw people near to their understanding of the gospel's salvific power. Moreover, Billy Kim took the opportunity to translate for Graham as a venue to preach his own sermon. His translation was one of the reasons so many gathered at the crusade, which brings me to my fourth point, that is South Korean leadership. Billy Kim surmised, quote, Interpreting for Billy Graham was more like giving a sermon than an interpretation because people attending were going to be listening to the sermon from the interpreter and not from Billy Graham. He further suggested that he was the main preacher. Quote, there were less than 5% who understand Billy Graham's English message. They have to depend on a Korean coming in. A lot of people said, looks like Billy Kim is preaching and Billy Graham is interpreting for the 5% of American soldiers. He's very confident. <laughs> In the aftermath of translation, Billy Kim became a celebrity overnight, and his church grew. Quote, at that time, my church was maybe three to 400. Since the crusade, now we probably have about 20,000 people. Today, South Korea is the home of the largest church in the world, the Oedo Full Gospel Church, which is also a project that I'm working on, and sends the most missionaries per capita out into the world than any country today. 1973 was not necessarily an auspicious year, theologically or politically, for Graham's success in South Korea. Yet Graham organized his largest crusade in Korea because of the role of religious experience, the support of Pak Chung-hee during a tense period of detente, the ongoing legacies of the Korean War, and the powerful role of a South Korean translator. For Billy and Billy, mounting the podium on June 3rd, 1973, not only was significant for saving souls, but also, whether, in whether they intended it or not, was important for re-enchanting U.S.-South Korean diplomatic relations. Thus, not only economic and political actors, but also non-state actors, including evangelists like Billy and Billy became a conduit through which diplomatic relations and national progress could be imagined and calibrated. And ultimately, the crusade fanned the flames of revival because it cultivated South Korean aspirations for national ascendance in the global Cold War order as preachers like Billy Kim wielded the power of evangelical revivalism for their own aims. Thanks so much. And our, uh, our third uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Uta Balbier.
uh, Associate Professor in Modern History at King's College London, where she teaches on American cultural <clears throat> and religious history. Uh, she's widely published on the interplay of evangelicalism, Cold War culture, and consumerism in the US and Europe. And she's in the process of completing uh, her book, Billy Graham in Europe, uh, Mass Evangelicalism, Consumerism, and uh, uh, the Free World. And uh, th that's something else I will be adding to my, uh, uh, my wish list with the, uh, with, with the others. Uh, Dr. Valier. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It is certainly an honor to be here, but uh, it is also a joy to be here. So thank you so much for those who have made this possible. I already enjoyed wonderful conversations, and I'm looking forward to continue them um, with the people on the panel, but also with you in the audience. So what I'm going to talk about today is part of a larger project. I'm writing a transnational history of Billy Graham's crusades in New York, London, and Berlin in the 1950s. And transnational for me means that I try to capture the flows between these crusades, what is transported across the Atlantic regarding missionary practices, spiritual practices like prayer, um, but also thoughts, ideas, ideologies. And um, I decided to zoom in on an event taking place in London. And my the title of my talk, uh, slightly offensive, may be bigger in London than in Dallas, but uh, it actually captures something I think that matters because Billy Graham's triumph was um, also shaped in Europe, not just here. That's what I want to talk about. So by 5th, 1954, Billy Graham was actually bigger news in London than in Texas. While he is still celebrated as America's pastor in chief, um, and while he has arguably transformed um, US evangelicalism in the second half of the 20th century like no other, his path to triumph was paved abroad. Would argue. Graham's historiographers, and two of them, who, which I really admire, are both in the audience, agree that his rise to national stardom dates to a rival meeting in Los Angeles in the fall of 49. But I would I like to argue here that it was in Europe that he grew into an internationally recognized religious leader. Zooming in on Graham's Greater London Crusade of 1954 enriches our understanding of Graham's revival work as a genuinely global project in its message, practices, and goals. It was international in three respects. What happened in London had significant ramifications for how Graham was perceived at home. London showed that Graham's mission for re-Christianization was a Western Cold War project, not just an American one, and the events in London shaped Graham's future mission in a very practical sense through the adaptation of missionary tools invented in the UK. Billy Graham's Greater London Crusade ran for 12 weeks between March 1st and May 24th and took place at Herringay Arena in London. The events attracted between 11 and 12,000 people each evening, but many more were turned away. 110,000 people attended the closing service at Wembley Stadium on May 24th, where the Archbishop of Canterbury, Geoffrey Fisher, offered the benediction, a clear recognition of Graham's work um, by the Church of England. Around 2 million people heard Graham speak while he was in London. 38,400 responded to his altar call. London was a truly energizing experience for British Christians and not just for evangelicals. Thousands of prayer groups established exactly after the American model of cottage prayer groups blew fresh, spiritual air into the British religious scene. And Graham became the focus for important debates in the religious but also the secular press about how a future of Christian faith could look like in Europe, how it could be made more accessible easier to consume, or as in the language of the times, more modern. Even though Herringay was modeled in nearly every single aspect after the first US crusades regarding structure of the organization, planning and running of the actual events, and of course fundraising, we should not read it as a one-way Americanization project. Herringay was a transnational project. What happened in London fed immediately back into the United States. The American religious and secular press followed Graham's first campaign in Britain 
in 1954, Moody Monthly dedicated an entire issue to Graham's London Crusade, while the Christian Herald also ran a series of reports. The secular press was no less interested. Time magazine followed every single step of Graham's campaign in Britain, from the celebratory welcome at Waterloo Station, to the early misgivings expressed in the British press, to a detailed report on the massive response to Graham's altar call, which the editors found rather surprising, considering the, na the nature of, I quote, traditionally phlegmatic Britons. Sorry, Alistair. It was this coverage of Graham's revival work in the UK and Europe that truly propelled Graham to evangelical stardom, both in America and abroad. As John Earl Selig of the Dallas Baptist Association observed after the first week of the Herringay revival, I quote, in fact, the London Crusade already has received more publicity here than the Dallas Crusade received during the entire time. The Times of London echoed this assessment when observing that Graham, I quote, has had to come to London to command the attention of the United Press as a whole. Graham's work in London clearly boosted Graham's credentials at home as it underscored the international adaptability and success of his revival work, in particular in a setting that was significantly more secular and less prone to revivalism than his home turf. That is why Graham left the US for London as a national celebrity, but, but he returned as an evangelical superstar. This ties closely into my second point. Herringay attracted the attention of the US press as it was a forceful display of Cold War culture and the special relationship between both countries. And here it, I tie nicely into what um, Helen already talked about. Senators and representatives were present at Herringay meetings. John Foster Dulles sent his regards. The closing service at Wembley Stadium opened with the singing of the American and the British national anthem. Flags of both countries were on display. Graham's preaching, which highlighted the special relationship between the UK and the US as the core of Western civilization in its fight against communism, further contributed to the perception that the London Crusade was significantly more than just a revival meeting. It was therefore not surprising that when Graham returned from Europe in 54, he was immediately invited to meet members of Congress and government officials to pass on his impressions of daily life close to the Iron Curtain. His meetings abroad with Winston Churchill during the London Crusade and with the Queen in 1955 also added to, this political, to his particular political credentials as in the words of Sherwood E. Wirt in Christianity Today. When he reflected back on the early years of Graham's revival work, he concluded, and I quote, the voice from the wilderness of the Carolina coastal plain had become interpreter of world events in the light of God's word and in the context of his conversations with queens and premiers. With his growing knowledge, expertise, and awareness of developments in, re in religious and political landscapes abroad, Graham's re-Christianization attempts were constructed and promoted as a transnational Western, not just an American project. The rhetoric surrounding Graham's revival work slowly changed after Herringay. He might have set out as America's savior, as American colleagues such as Jonathan Herzog have convincingly shown. But he returned from Europe as the savior of the West, as an imagined spiritual Cold War community. There's a third and last point I would like to make. Europe did not just provide the numbers and images to boost Graham at home. British evangelicals made a significant conceptual contribution to the future running of Graham's Metropolitan Revival Meetings, Operation Andrew. This is the point where my students are rolling their eyes because they can't hear it anymore. But Operation Andrew, in short, meant that churches and prayer groups should charter buses to take their members, and more importantly, unchurched friends of their members, to the Crusades. Operation Andrew is playing an important role in my own research as a forceful reminder of how important the own position and perspective of the researcher is. As a European, when I saw the first images of the Operation Andrew buses parked outside Madison Square Garden during the New York Crusade in 57, I immediately interpreted them as a modern image of US evangelicalism. 
They, for me, symbolize the seamless interplay between mobility, modernity, and evangelicalism, which I interpreted as American. Yet, as I learned later, Operation End was a brainchild of the British evangelicals who saw themselves confronted with the particular challenge of running Graham's first metropolitan crusade. Before the beginning of the crusade, Operation Andrew was introduced to the British audience in a prayer partner newsletter. The flyer mentioned the scriptural basis for um, and the missionary considerations considered that spoke in favor of Operation Andrew but it also described the modern phenomenon of urbanization as a significant factor in the creation of the new missionary tool, which was at the same time, I quote, scriptural, practical, and effectual. The journey to and from the Crusades should be used for praying, singing, and discussions about questions of faith, and eyewitness reports show that it was. Operation Andrew was exported as a concept to the US where it arrived on January 7, 1957 during an executive committee meeting in preparation of the New York Crusade. Operation Andrew, used in New York, followed the UK model in such detail that the New York organizers invited the UK-based Reverend Stephen Alford, pastor of Duke Street Baptist Church in Richmond, England, to publish his experiences with the scheme. The fact that missionary practices from the UK easily found entry into Graham's ministry again highlights the international and Western nature of the project. This should encourage us to think about Graham's mission beyond its obvious Americanness and ask instead how transcultural processes of modernization and Westernization have shaped Graham and his mission in its early years. Thank you. Well, thanks to uh, th uh, three, uh, uh, three excellent uh, uh, papers. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, just take the opportunity to kind of ask some uh, questions just to kind of develop uh, uh, discussion uh, a little bit. And I I'm going to tell our uh, presenters the most important thing they need to know, which is on these handheld microphones, there is a, an on switch. And uh, that, 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 the, uh, that, that does work uh, well, so I strongly encourage you to press that before, uh, before speaking. Um, one of the hardest things to remember, perhaps, when you look at the years from, I don't know, the 40s through the 80s, is the, uh, the dominance of uh, Cold War and uh, nuclear uh, realities as a fact underlying uh, so much. Uh, when we look back, for example, at uh, uh, Billy Graham's rhetoric in the 40s and 50s, uh, so much of it has a Cold War emphasis. This is the age um, at which there was the new weapon called the hydrogen bomb, and the uh, common description of that was the <coughs> hell bomb. Uh, and in other words, with that sort of religious rhetoric, and it was a very powerful symbol of, um, uh, uh, of apocalypse. And one thing that emerges from all these uh, presentations in different ways is the sense of that, that larger Cold War frame. The, uh, the World Council of Churches, of course, had all those divisions about uh, liberation movements. Um, so what, what I'd like to do uh, at, as a start is maybe I could just ask uh, uh, Uta and um, Helen, um, you, you are both dealing with uh, Billy Graham in different kinds of a Cold War context. Are there any kind of uh, commonalities or differences that strike you in looking at the other person's uh, uh, presentation or uh, th things that uh, you, you kind of uh, take away? I don't know which of you would care to uh, address that or... Helen, do you want to... Well, well, I could do a very mean thing and just pass this on to Helen because I have a question that is actually related to that. So because you're saying, yes, um, Graham brought this Cold War rhetoric over, um, took it with him to the world, but I also find the performances striking. So, I mean, the pinnacle of his Cold War revival work um, in Europe for me is uh, the year 1960 when Billy Graham in Berlin, a divided city, set up a revival tent that was based basically facing the Brandenburg Gate. I mean, that was probably the most political space 
in, on the entire world, and Graham went there. He went there saying, of course I'm not coming for political reasons, but the decision to set a tent up there communicated something beyond what he said. So I would like to encourage Helen to tell us a little bit more about the, the, the Cold War performance during the crusade you introduced us to in such a brilliant way. Great. Thanks for the question, Philip, and uh, for your comments. Also, Uta, and your presentation. Um, well, I mean, I think one of the main distinctions with the Cold War in Asia in general, and then Cold War in Korea in particular, is that many scholars believe that the Cold War is unending, an unending Cold War, or an unending Korean War. I mean, today, so many of us can see North and South Korea in the news. Right, so um, that has to do with the legacies of the Korean War, the first hot war, which still, in 1953, it, ended, it didn't, the war didn't end. Right, so because it's an unending war and Koreans, South Koreans today still are in mandatory military service and you can't cross into the north and that 38th parallel remains the theological and political metaphor, as well as the literal uh, experience of war, is something that continues, and I think continues to shape Korean Christianity as well as its relationship to American evangelicalism, in particular in American Christianity in general. So I think this, and the fact that the wars in Asia during the Cold War weren't cold, they're hot. So the Vietnam War, as well as the Korean War, that's a major, I think, um, difference. So, yeah, and then you want to ask about the performance. So. Yeah. No worries, but I don't want to go back to the performance, but I think what our cases have in common actually is that we're talking about divided countries because Germany as well in, um, is a divided country, which makes it quite difficult for Graham. Um, when he's asked to adjust his anti-communist rhetoric by the West German evangelicals because they fear that his anti-communist commitment basically cuts out the, the people who live in the eastern part of the country. They're still able to attend the crusades. East Germans come, they cross the border, they're still able to do that in Berlin in 1960. Um, but West German evangelicals again and again remind Graham um, we're, part, we're part of a community that crosses the Iron, uh, Iron Curtain, not just in the sense of Christianity, but also in the sense of nationality. So, and I'm sure that, that you might find a similar discourse in Korea. I, I, I know nothing about this, but uh, that particular 1960 crusade, is that one of the factors that persuades the Russians to erect the Berlin Wall? But I think we would give Graham much, too, way too much credit okay, if, well, if we assume that. Okay, fair enough. Um, as I said at the uh, beginning, uh, th there's just so much happening in terms of the, uh, the growth of Christianity around the world, Africa, Asia especially, um, and from the, the 1960s and 70s onwards. And I, I'd really like to ask, uh, uh, this may be starting with um, um, Alistair, how conscious is Graham of these, uh, uh, these trends? And is it legitimate to say that he is able kind of to see beyond the older Cold War divisions to a, you know, a, a, a very different kind of um, Christian world? To put it in maybe a, a, a provocative way, is, is he stuck in the old world or is he able to kind of see, see beyond? By old world, do you mean dominance of Western Christians? Yes, sure, and uh, 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 an East-West divide underlying everything. At, at least in terms of his international work on the level of uniting evangelicals, I don't see the East-West divide being a, a major consideration for yeah. him, though clearly it is in his crusade work. I, I would say that Graham is very switched on, actually, to the way that the world church is changing. And there's a big push at Lausanne and in his Amsterdam uh, conferences to have a very large proportion of the participants coming from places outside the US and outside Europe. Uh, and again, I, I'm thinking about something that uh, Grant said last night, I, 
I, I'm not sure he's on the cutting edge of, of, of those realizations, but he's, he's pretty quick. And I think one of the ways you see that is in his willingness to have speakers from outside of Europe and the United States um, giving plenary sessions at Lausanne. Mm -hmm. um, so was he perfect? No. Was he rather slow to include women in their role as evangelists? Yes. But I think he's certainly very alert to the way the global church has changed by the time you get to the 1970s. Please. And I think just to add to that, um, you know, Alistair, you spoke on Lausanne, which happened in 1974, and the crusade I spoke about was 1973, and I didn't have space to add this quote, but after Graham is in Korea, you know, he talks about, I have this quote about how he thinks that the church is moving toward the Far East, he says, and that, you know, he's forever changed because of his, his Ex crusade experience in South Korea, and that he encourages Americans to go experience the Korean church, especially because they're such strong, he uses the language, uh, believers in the Bible. So uh, my sense is that Graham is very much attuned to the trends of you know, non-Western Christianity. Does that, I mean, as you see in my presentation, does that erase the significance that politicians will use to, you know, to view him as an American, not necessarily, but he's definitely attuned to the ways in which Christianity, at least in 1973, is expanding in a place like Korea. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, in that sense, I think the transnational flows that um, Uta talked about, um, along those, that religious plane, um, just as there are transnational flows uh, between Europe and the U.S., as you talked about, there are in Korea. So. You know, it's interesting. We, you know, we look back at, uh, say, um, uh, Edinburgh uh, in back in uh, uh, back in 1910, and uh, you know, they're, they're very conscious of a, a, a global uh, a global context. Um, but but the thing that strikes you time and again about um, about Billy Graham is how he is. Um, fully tuned in to all the uh, media uh, opportunities, the media sense of really a, 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 a possible uh, globalized perspective in a way which just had not been, uh, had not been possible um, uh, before. Well, look, um, I'd like to uh, throw this open for anyone who wishes to uh, uh, ask a question or uh, make, a, make a contribution. And I would just ask you please to uh, come to the... Uh, Come to the microphone if you uh, choose to do so. And oh, I'm sorry. Sure, sorry. Too much more annoyance. Good. Sorry. Hey, anyone care to ask any? Uh, any questions here? Please, Alicia. So I'm really struck by this emerging conversation about Graham representing old order, Graham embracing new order. Um, one of the things that came up last night was, was Graham ever challenged by someone and decided, okay, I'll go along with your view instead, and John Stott was the example or we've, we've heard from Uda this logistical development of Operation Andrew that went from England to the US. Transnational, still very much old world order. Um, putting plenary speakers on a program, very, very important. Rejecting their calls for social justice, very, very problematic. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly how to phrase it as a question, but I, I, I would like to hear more of the discussion of Old world, not east west, but first world, third world, or old British Anglo American order. Um, what is the division that is operative there, and how is he moving beyond that and not moving beyond that? Please. <laughs> First everyone's reluctant and then everyone leaps at once. Alistair. I think it's a great question and a great point. It's one thing to listen to John Stott 
and in a letter after the Mexico meeting where Stott and Graham try, are trying to patch it up, Graham says, there's no one in the world that I would more willingly follow than you. Much more difficult to imagine him saying that to a brother or a sister from the developing world. I think that's a great question. And I defer to Bill and Grant and Uta and others who've worked on Graham more than I have to know whether there are good examples of him not only listening to but being obviously influenced by the thought of those sorts of people. Uta, did you want to... Uh... It is a brilliant question, and I have to say it came up in Grant's talk last night uh, as along the same lines. And um, already last night, I was not able to think of this one person who influenced Graham. Um, so it's pretty, I, I would probably invite Graham and Bill to say if there is this one person in Europe who influenced Graham. I think um, what I find very, very striking is how Graham, when he came back from Europe, emphasized certain things that he changed in his missionary in his mission while he was abroad. And one definitely concerns um, um, what I find striking is his his pre he's saying it. He's saying I preach significantly more on sin in the U.S. Um, and the, basically the fear of God than I do in Europe which I find absolutely striking, um, but he, which for me basically shows that he is aware that in London and in Germany particularly, he is addressing a significantly more secular faith, a faith that is kind of tamed, a faith that is no longer focusing on hell and sin and challenges. So that is the one quote that I remember from him where he said, well, I definitely had to adjust this because my audience is, um, is different. Another thing where I find him incredibly reflective is how he, and I, I had to smile when Helen immediately said, like, he goes to Korea and he introduces himself, like, I'm not an American, I'm a Christian. He does exactly the same in Hamburg, he does it in Berlin, and of course, he is an American, and every German who looks at him sees him as an American. It adds tremendously to the attraction. Yes, he is so good looking, he is the Hollywood, the Hollywood film star, he brings the entertainment in the world of faith over, but Graham himself, it does something to him. I got this feeling he turns more more and more into a cosmopolitan in the way he preaches. When he preaches at LA, strongly influenced by his experiences with youth abroad in Europe, in his first sermon, he mentions Europe six times. That's what he's saying. I've been to Europe six times. He was shaped by Europe because he saw in his Youth for Christ days, um, basically destruction. He saw what war can do to a country. He saw poverty, he saw suffering, but that it did something to him. So, and I think that's, it is more the influences and experiences that really transformed him into a global citizen. I would say, maybe you have a good example from the Korean um, case where someone actually challenged him and influenced him. Thinking about his first experience in Korea in 1952, which I briefly mentioned and how he wrote um, the Korean War Diary he published, and he said that uh, he went in to Korea a boy and came out a man because of his experiences in Korea. And I think that um, part of what he's referencing there is just seeing all of the devastating suffering from the war. And I think it does pull on his heart and um, in some ways strengthens uh, his convictions because of not only the suffering seen through the war, but also the martyrdom of Christians in Korea. You know, I, uh, I, I remember a phrase that was quite popular on the, uh, the new left on, in the late 60s and 70s, and it was a political idea, and it was uh, causes that were lost in Europe may yet be won in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And uh, as I listened to um, Helen, um, I'm just wondering, would it be fair to say, or, or is this going too far, that what Billy Graham is seeing in Korea is the hope for what could have been in China had China not been lost? In other words, Korea is 
China if things had gone correctly? Yeah, part uh, with my book, I am framing it in a trans-Pacific context yes. because it's not just U.S.-Korea. The, the specter of China is very much present. Right. So, you know, for instance, when Graham, Graham first goes to Korea in 1952, because he's partially because he's invited by Bob Pierce, the head of World Vision, and Bob Pierce is a good example of what you're asking. Somebody who goes to China to devote his life there and gets kicked out in 1949 with the rise of Mao. So he, he goes actually uh, soon thereafter to Korea and then founds World Vision in 1950. So there's this constant fear, I think, that South Korea will not only become like China, but also like North Korea. Right, so, and in general, the fact that Christianity does not have a large presence in Asia, right? So, I think that the specter of China and Chinese communism is part, a core part of the narrative here, yeah. By the way, I'm just gonna mention one, uh, one key date I always find very, very helpful, and this does get back to, I suppose, a German view. Uh, which was in 1980, you have the, uh, the Brandt uh, Commission. Um, and uh, the Brandt Commission may not uh, re resonate uh, uh, too much today, but it does popularize a phrase we all know. And what it basically says is, you know, for years we've talked about East and West and communists and capitalists, but the most important division is between the wealthy countries in the northern part of the world and the poorer countries in the southern part and we have to focus on altogether now the global south and uh, that global south idea very much grows out of the uh, Brandt Commission in 1980 and that's kind of quite a transformative idea in terms of uh, 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 views of uh, views of religion and views of Christianity uh, as well. Um, as I say, uh, any, anyone who wishes to uh, uh, leap in or comment, please. Oh, please do. Yes, sorry, Roger. Bill stood, and he may be able to answer this. Um, this is just curiosity. We haven't talked about Latin America very much, but the name Louis Palau came up last night, and I do have a vague impression in the back of my mind that at some point in Billy Graham's career, uh, some people perceived him as possibly anointing Louis Palau as his successor, at least in Latin America. Is there anything to that? <laughs> Nobody knows, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's largely true. I remember that uh, uh, Christianity Today, in the back part of Christianity Today, month after month would have something about Luis Palau. And I think that um, I had some time to spend with Luis Palau, and um, I think he expected to be the Billy Graham successor, uh, at least in, but perhaps That's not, my yes, too. perhaps not restricted. I have a question for you, I perfectly agree with you that, uh, that Haringey was critical importance. Would you say something about the, the landline relays and how that, because that was really the start of, of spreading the word, and, and, and that, you know, when you see what has happened and, you know, what happens now, but it all started, really, with the landline relays. With, well, thank you so much. That's a, a brilliant question, an invitation to talk about something that I'm, 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 I'm writing around in my book, because, but it's a brilliant story. So what the British evangelicals decided, basically, um, was because so many people had to be turned away. Um, it was really in 54, that is before the economic takeoff in the United Kingdom, that will set in just a little bit later, but um, it's pretty hard to travel. So um, what the, actually the, the British evangelicals decide is to use telephone lines to transmit the Haringey Crusade um, to places in the, in, the British, in the north, for example, to Manchester um, or to Birmingham. And um, what is really, really interesting is how basically these, um, the, the audiences at the relay services, they gather, gather around this um, basically transmitter, this radio, and they listen to Graham, and we still do have conversions. And that is something that Billy Graham then again and again used when he was interviewed by the British press to say, it's not about my charisma, you know, it even works when they just hear my voice. So, um, yes, but of course it shows um, 
it comes back to what uh, Professor Jenkins said earlier. It's this, um, the willingness to experiment with ever new forms. And um, what I find striking, how the British evangelicals immediately embrace all these opportunities. They really see Billy Graham as, um, as, as an opportunity, the Grand Crusades as an opportunity to experiment with ever new um, uh, tools and instruments to reach out um, to people to people of faith and people um, without faith. Um, they're significantly more, well, they're easier to adapt to that than, um, for example, the German evangelicals, where you can see how B Billy Graham builds on the transatlantic history of revivalism. I mean, the revivalist preachers, Moody, but you can go back even further, further they, tried, they crossed the Atlantic. There is, there is this family of transatlantic um, uh, revivalism and evangelicalism, and the Germans, because of language, sit a little bit outside of that, but uh, that makes it significantly harder for them. They embark, embark on a real learning curve when they, uh, when they run their first German crusades in cooperation with the American team. Great question. You know, it's very hard for us to uh, r remember today, prior to the 1960s or 70s, just how um, hard it is to do, for instance, uh, a television show on both sides of the, uh, uh, the Atlantic. That's a, sort of a major, um, a, a, a major event and just the uh, uh, speed in the sense of that uh, instant communication. Um, just one question that uh, arose about the uh, uh, different revivals. As we, uh, we know, one key principle of uh, the Graham revivals is uh, working closely with um, local churches, local leaders, trying to have the best possible uh, relations with those. Um, now, of course, if, uh, if Billy Graham is in the United States, he knows roughly the way these people think. Uh, he knows what they, uh, how they're going to approach things. They speak a uh, common language. How far is there maybe a cultural divide when he interacts with churches in that very different uh, setting? Now, you, uh, uh, Helen drew that very interesting uh, uh, point about translation, which is, which is fascinating. Um, how far does he understand the way the churches think there? Are they at, uh, uh, at odds over their assumptions? Uh, how, how do they cope? Do, how do the revivals uh, interact with that kind of local context, whether it's in Germany or Korea or, uh, yeah? Well, I think two points. Um, you know, the point that Uta made about Billy Graham's cosmopolitanism. I think that his charisma had this global reach in a way that maybe some other American evangelists really struggled with. So for instance, even somebody like Bill Bright, who does have a revival in 1974 in Korea, he makes some more blunders, actually, with the newspapers and talking about religious freedom in Korea in a way that Graham didn't with his 1973 crusade. So there's something I think about his agility in working across national borders that makes him distinct. Um, and I think in the Korea case, this is the second point, is that he had experience in going to Korea during the war. So if you look at all the images, uh, there are hundreds of photos that were taken during his trip to Korea in 1952. He's experiencing early morning prayer, dawn prayer that's unique to the Korean church at 5 a.m. waking up and you know barely having time to wash your face and just going to pray with the locals. And he worked very closely with Reverend Han Kyung-jik, who's a Korean Presbyterian pastor and ultimately created the largest Presbyterian church in the world. And he had a close relationship with him then in the 50s. And ha Reverend Han was the executive chairman of this crusade. So it's a relationship that continued into the 70s. And I think that those, because of, because of that previous travel, he was able to more smoothly um, work with the Koreans. In addition, somebody like Billy Kim was trained in the South at Bob Jones and saw Billy Graham at his crusade in 1957 in Madison Square Garden. And that's when he first thought, I want to also become an evangelist. So there's a way in, Graham, in terms of Graham's just itinerancy, his global presence, there's something about the frequency with which he's meeting with people all over the world that makes, I think, 
his interactions more seamless than maybe some other uh, American evangelists. So let me just briefly talk about the German case because that is really, really interesting. Because the thing is, in the early 50s, Billy Graham doesn't care too much about the different religious landscapes, um, but the churches, the local churches, do care about Billy Graham and uh, his religious offer. And the German case is so interesting because the one group who is not willing to support Billy Graham's crusade in 54 in Berlin and Düsseldorf are the German evangelicals. They consider him, and it's not a theological um, standpoint, they consider him way too modern, or as they insist again again, American, 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 which is short for shallow and not serious. So which is really, really interesting. They, in, they experience him during 54, they go to the Crusades, and of course they want to bring him back in 55. They definitely see the sincerity, the genuity and everything. So he wins them over. But what he will struggle with, I'm not sure he was ever aware, because it always happened when the Americans um, left, the, left the room, the real challenge for the German evangelicals was Billy Graham's commitment to send every believer to the church he or she indicated they wanted to be sent to. And that didn't work in Germany. For a simple reason. You find evangelicals across the denominational spectrum in the US, you find evangelicals in the UK, in the Anglican Church and um, outside. In Germany there's a clear divide between the official Protestant Church and being an evangelical. When you're an evangelical, you're proudly not a member of the official Protestant Church and the other way around. Very strong tensions, they develop in a very dynamic interplay um, based on competition. But so the American team, 54, 55, 60, whenever Billy Graham comes back, the Americans remind the local organizers, you will send every inquirer to the church he or she indicates. And the second they're out of the room, the Germans pray about it, they pray more about it, and in the end, they're not doing it. They're not doing it. They're, taking, they, they're sending the souls to evangelical churches because they so firmly believe that they can't be saved through the official Protestant church, which is really, really fascinating. Not sure what Billy ever found out, and I'm glad he didn't. I'm sorry, just ask one uh, question. Um, in terms of the different kind of um, factions and national groups within the uh, Lausanne movement, were, were there ones that uh, uh, Billy Graham got on with particularly well and was likely to come into particular uh, conflict with over these kind of cultural issues? Or, or was it chiefly a matter of uh, you know, the kind of personalities that we're talking about? It's a little difficult to answer because of the way that after the Mexico City meeting in January 75, Graham is then flying at 38,000 feet um, as relates to the organization. He's not really down in the nitty gritty of the letter writing and week in, week out, month out, month out, organizing, et cetera, et cetera. That's left to Leighton Ford and Stott and others. Uh, and uh, I say Mensa. Um, the biggest challenge in 1974-75 was clearly between evangelicals from the United States and evangelicals from Latin America. Um, though even that needs to be qualified in as much as the two most prominent Latin American evangelicals at Lausanne had both had significant experience in North America as well. Rene Padilla was a student at Wheaton. Samuel Escobar had led into varsity in Canada. And so it's not as though they are um, in any way ignorant of, of North American evangelicalism. Um, so in the context of Lausanne, I don't think there are any clear lines there. Again, I would defer to others whether um, globally he's more attentive to or interested in or friendly with evangelicals from East Asia, say, than evangelicals from Latin America. I mean, obviously the, the politics of US Latin American relations are very fraught in a way that is unsurprising 
if it's going to fill in, uh, flow into uh, relations between evangelicals in a way that would be less true, I think, of relations between American evangelicals and people in Africa or South Asia, for example. So I think it's predictable that there would be greater tension in the Western Hemisphere than transoceanically. By the way, it's interesting. Uh, if you were to look at uh, global Christian debates now, um, Africa would be very, very high on the list of considerations. And I think that's probably a, a, a possibly our first mention of Africa, which just was not part of the map, part of the concern in anything like the same way in the 70s that it would be today. And that really sends a very powerful message about how, how much and how recent the growth has, um, has been. Uh, when Africa features in the 70s debates, it's the World Council of Churches uh, debates over supporting liberation movements and so on, but it's not in terms of this kind of mass upsurge of, uh, uh, of popular churches. Well, look, uh, your, uh, your, your opportunity to uh, raise questions, raise, uh, 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 raise comments. I'm just going to add w w one word just as a footnote that uh, uh, strikes me, which has been mentioned a couple of times. Again, uh, if you look back at the history of this era, maybe the mid-70s, um, it's, it's a very strange period we've kind of forgotten, which is the age of uh, uh, detente, which uh, Helen is mentioning in a Korean context. And there's the great hope of, if not communists and the West uh, getting together in a peaceful way, at least we can relax tensions. And this culminates in the, was the Helsinki Agreement is what, 75? Um, and th that poses uh, a, a lot of opportunities for evangelicals, but um, also a lot of uh, challenges in terms of the uh, relationship with, uh, uh, with communist countries. You know, we had about 25 years when the Cold War had thoroughly gone away and it so thoroughly dropped out of our consciousness. We've uh, rather forgotten so much uh, about it. How wonderful it is that we have a whole new Cold War with Russia to, to restore the, these ideas. Yes, I'm saying that. Never mind. Um, well, look. Uh, uh, and uh, unless anyone has any kind of uh, uh, further uh, issues, I'm just going to say um, I'm very uh, grateful to uh, um, our three uh, speakers for excellent presentations. Um, uh, I, I certainly have learned uh, a, a great deal uh, from them. And maybe the, the most interesting thing for me is the assumptions that people have at this point, which is not that far back um, historically, which are so radically different from what they might be uh, today and uh, what a very rapidly changed situation uh, that is. And um, once again, uh, seeing things through the lens of, the, of Billy Graham and his movement is just a, a, a fascinating way for getting into all these other uh, fields and, um, and themes. So I will just uh, ask you to join me in uh, thanking our, uh, our speakers.